Thank you for everyone who's joined around Europe. I've seen uh, Switzerland, that's Slovakia, uh, Greece, Germany, uh, Denmark. So it's fantastic having so many people join this session. We're going to be with you for around about an hour, one hour, and you've seen from that holding slide, hopefully, we have a distinguished panel of experts, experts who are in their own rights, um, venue managers, security managers, people involved in important venues and iconic venues around Europe, by all means, and by no means, sorry, all venues, but a bunch of really uh, significant ones. It's your chance to ask them a question as to how are we managing in this crisis? What are we doing with the staff? What are we doing with events? We normally, I normally run these sorts of events uh, from a studio, a TV studio at Cranfield University. Uh, we're having to run these events now from my study, as you can see. I've read one or two of these books behind me here. And I'm joined this morning uh, by my co-host, Chris Kemp, uh, who is a professor and an expert in crowded spaces and counterterrorism. Chris, can I hand over to you, please, just to introduce yourself and then say a little bit more about who's going to be speaking today? Uh, it's really, really good to be here today. Uh, it's very strange not sitting next to you on the settee, drinking our lattes, because, <laughs> you know, all right, we're under very, very unusual and difficult circumstances. Um, but it's, it's going to be pretty good today as well, even though we can't be in the studio together. Um, today, um, I think one of the most difficult things that we have is that we're facing somebody, something that nobody knew what it would be like when we had a wicked crisis. There's no right answer to the problem. There's loads of immediate reaction taking place. Some governments have cracked down harshly. Others have done it in a more measured way. However, it's really the lack of practice and unified response, and that was never going to happen. So COVID-19 is a bit like in the events industry. It's a bit like electricity. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't hear it. But if you touch it, it can be fatal. And that's a pretty bad place to be in. Um, what it's done is it put venues in lockdown, public gatherings forbidden, and all but online contact really possible. And I think these are really unprecedented times. And what we're trying to do today is create, first and foremost, a community of people where people can listen to other venues that are utilizing different ways of facing into the crisis, um, and then having their say by asking questions. And I think the issue forms three parts. The first is, what did we miss pre-virus that could have helped us make more proactive decisions? And I think that was a really difficult one because nobody imagined what would happen because we've never seen the like of it before. And then secondly, what we're doing during the virus to help the music, art and entertainment industry survive. And thirdly, how are we going to react once the virus has been eradicated? Although we can't answer those questions fully, I think we can gain a lot from today's event. Um, and make those coming into it more reassured of their livelihoods by what is taking place. But I think the other thing that's really important is the fact that people have somewhere to come to and talk and somewhere where they can see other people from different venues, different events, because that really gives people hope and it allows them to see those kind of things. And I think to me, that's the most important thing. So before we start, I'd just like to introduce the panel, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, so, Danielle, let's start with who. Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Chris. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Thanks for putting this on, and it's good to be with you. Um, I'm Danielle Kennedy-Clark. I am the Deputy GM at CO2, uh, based in London. So I look after all of the operations for the building, so that includes security, any management, production, um, all of the front-of-house teams and operations um, for the site in its entirety. Thank you very much, Daniel. That's really good. Liam, good to have you here as well today. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do? Of course. Nice to see you, mate. Um, good morning, all. Uh, my name's Liam Boylan. I'm the GM for Wembley Stadium. Um, we, with our venue, um, obviously a well-known stadium, but I'm not sure people understand exactly how it works. Um, it works in a lot of peaks and troughs, unlike our colleagues at the O2 and Roundhouse and other venues that are on here. Um, because the National Stadium, um, we're kind of putting on obviously football, but we're a multi-purpose venue. So our peaks and troughs go with concert calendars, uh, NFL, um, and then we normally have big pauses in between events. Um, and that's how 
with this coming along, we've kind of adapted a little bit quicker because we're used to mothballing the stadium quite quickly. Um, but that's the kind of challenges we've had to look at. Thank you, Liam. And Sam, you run a very, very different kind of venue. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, my name's Sam. Hi, everyone. And I am the Commercial and Operations Director at the Roundhouse, which is in Camden in London. And Roundhouse, well-known music venue, but there's a lot more we do as well. So it, with my role, I'm responsible for the technical and production teams, the operations teams, which is uh, facilities, visitor services, etc. And also commercially, our events team, commercial strategy and food and beverage. And um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about exactly what we get involved with, but um, we're a, a, a very busy venue, as with many people. And the effect that it's had on us is, is, um, is clear. It's, it's the same effect that it's had on everybody across, across the sector, really. Um, and with us being involved in the arts as well, we've perhaps got a little bit of a different view on things and a little bit of a different way of looking at um, our approach than everybody else as well. Thanks very much, Sam, for that. Uh, Pascal, coming from Switzerland, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? <clears throat> yes, um, good morning, everybody. Hello to the people connected to this webinar. Uh, my, my name is Pascal Vio. I'm head of the department, safety, security, and services for Paleo Festival, uh, the largest open air festival in Switzerland, welcoming uh, 50,000 people per day during six days each year on the third week of July since 45 years now. Uh, I'm also a sociologist and a researcher associated to the Laboratory of Urban Sociology at the Polytechnical School in Lausanne, where I hold a PhD in 2013 dealing with risk management, security issues and urban planning during major events. And last but not least, I'm the director of ISSU, the Swiss Institute for Urban and Event Safety, providing education and consultancy for, for the public and private sector in, in this field. Thank you, Pascal. And Morten, uh, your offence is 50 years old this year, isn't it? So it's good to hear from you. Yes, I am the head of security of Rust Festival in Denmark. And as you mentioned, we have a 50-year anniversary this year uh, for the festival that's going to run in uh, three months. So we are really looking forward to that one, but it's a challenge. My role is head of security, so I'm responsible, of course, for the safety of all of the audience at the festival, the cooperation with the authorities, regular stuff like that. And um, on top of that, we have a company within the festival who is providing services for other uh, promoters. So we are, uh, at the moment, uh, being hit of all the cancellations or postponements of Live Nation and other venues where we are providing safety staff for them. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to go over to Danielle to, to ask her how her venue and the company is coping with the crisis at the present time and what safety measures have you got in place? Um, well, I think as, as it is for everyone, Chris, it's just a crazy time for all of us and it's been really tough um, on, on everybody involved within the industry. Um, but, you know, we we are looking forward to the future. Um, we we are confident and are ever the optimist that we will be bouncing back as soon as physically possible. But um, for us, it's been very phased approach. You know, we really got our uh, strategic recovery group together and we followed all of the guidelines and we've kept ourselves up to speed all through this process. And it seems like it's been forever that we've been going through this process already, but ultimately it's been quite a quick process. Um, we're lucky that we have a great team at the O2, so that's been quite formulaic um, and, and we do have, you know, our business continuity plans in place, which has really helped us. But ultimately, you know, we didn't have all the answers to this as uh, nobody does. And it doesn't matter how many exercises you've run or how many kind of things you've tried out in the past, you know, this has been very difficult and, and and we've had to really think on our feet and in order to move forward. So, as I said, it's been a phased approach. We had a team together. So we've been meeting um, continuously to make sure that we are agile and flexible and can, and can move forward. Um, from a safety measures perspective, 
you know, ultimately we, have, we are now a closed building. Um, all our events are pretty much postponed to the foreseeable um, and that's been challenging to try and move that, you know, to the later parts of the, of, um, of the year. Um, and all of our workforce as well now is predominantly based from home and, and working, you know, um, non, not in the venue. For the guys that do have to still be in the venue, and there's a small number of those now, we're just making sure that they stay as safe as possible and we have clear sort of um, guidelines of who can come into the building, how social distance works, making sure that those guys are always protected um, and because ultimately, you know, we have to keep our workforce safe and um, that, that's, been, that's been challenging, but I think we are now all adapting together. So they're the main safety features that we have in place at the moment and, and, and how the venue's kind of been coping with things. Danielle, thank you very much. You sound to be on top of everything there. Um, I want to pass on now to Liam, Liam Boylan. Liam, you have an iconic stadium there. I think everyone's heard of Wembley. Um, and you had the postponement of the Euros. This is quite a big thing. I know we're joined today by smaller festival and venue sites and greenfield sites, but tell us more about how you're coping, Liam, with uh, something as big as Wembley Stadium. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, because of those peaks and troughs, we're kind of used to mothballing. If you think about Wembley Stadium, normally we'd have an event in November, normally uh, international, and then our next event is the Carabao Cup, which is normally the end of Feb, beginning of March. So we're used to closing down the stadium for those sort of three, four months, and then how to mothball it. Um, this was different because obviously we weren't prepared for suddenly losing that calendar and what that would be. Um, Euros was a huge one. Um, whilst all the pressure was on UEFA to um, postpone it, it's not a simple thing of just picking it up and dropping it into the next year and how that would affect our calendar for next year because we had to create space um, for Euro 2020. Um, the R is the national stadium, a football stadium, um, while still multi-use. Football will always be the priority. We're owned by the Football Association. Um, so when for 2020, we kind of moved our concert calendar, which for all um, stadiums in the UK is, is normally June, maybe the beginning of July if you're lucky. Um, so we kind of lost that moving it back. Um, so to look at that, to go forward with that for 2021, we're obviously looking at things that are already penciled in for 21 and how that will fit in. Um, but football will always be the priority to make that work. And it was difficult, and it is, but there's a tournament team that are based actually in the stadium. So whereas a normal, a lot of the stadiums in Europe had an LOS would come in, they're effectively an LOS, but they were our team, and they basically moved over to become a tournament team. So they understood the venue very well, and it really helped me. So when I was sitting down, I was sitting down with experts who understand their role in the tournaments, but also understand my needs for the stadium, for what I need. Um, so it made it easier. Um, I think Danielle's right in that it does feel like we've been doing this for months, um, but it was really, really quick how that reacted. Um, we've been quite fortunate in talking to a lot of our colleagues and trying to quickly see what best practices are. Um, you quickly, within three days, suddenly understand what a best practice is. So we were following colleagues um, over in Europe who were ahead of us on the curve just to see what they were doing and then what we could learn from that. And I think Danielle's right about the business continuity. We had a great um, business continuity plan and, and it worked right across the board, but this is not in anybody's. So you quickly trying to adapt it, how it would work for the stadium. Um, and then it's just closing down the stadium and um, working with the teams who are left there. It's really important that the guys who left there can quickly feel isolated um, because people can't travel in and it's only essential workers. You have to show leadership. You have to get in there and show your face to these guys because you can't simply fall back on the, I'm not allowed to travel, I'll see you in three months. Um, they they will panic. You know, they're, they're put in a position they've never been in before. Yes, they've got their roles, whether it's security, whether it's engineers, um, the grounds team, got to go in, the grass keeps growing. They've got to get in there to look after it. And then it was when we heard this news about the police for suddenly having their um, powers to stop people. It was, okay, how do we address that? So it was quickly looking out for best practice on what letters we could give them of authorization to travel to work. That's a reassurance that the guys needed so that if they were stopped by the police, they produced this letter. Um, quickly learning all those things and all those things will go into the business continuity you know if we god forbid this ever happens again but if it does these are the things that we'll learn from and that's what we'll have there in that actual new plan going forward 
I think, Lynn, that's a, a really good point. And the, the one thing about all of this is if there's some issue or somebody causing an issue, then it would be taste and people wouldn't be doing the same kind of thing. Because everybody is in the same boat and everybody is pulling together and it's really been good to see this. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. It's, it's very easy to talk to people on this because we're all facing exactly the same challenges. So you quickly pass on those things that you've learned. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you for that. Sam, you run a beautiful venue, which is kind of the centre of community in London. How are you coping with this and what effect is it having on your community, especially in the areas of arts and culture, which are really important to your area? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, the Roundhouse has a history of great music and our, and our story really is legendary. But we are also synonymous with arts and culture. And our point of difference compared, I, I think, to everyone else here is that, yes, we're a commercial venue in that we raise income. We're also a registered charity, and we work with thousands of young people each year. And at the moment, obviously, there's no school, and there's also no ability to come to our programmes, music, media, uh, performing arts, etc. Um, we can't meet young people in person, but we are offering advice and information online to our young people, many of whom are vulnerable, and they use art and music, etc., as, as a positive outlet. Um, our commercial side is what helps fund those programmes. And so to have lost that funding does put the programmes themselves at risk. And we have diverse audiences and, and young people in all genres, music, artistic shows, theatre, charity events, corporate events. And at the moment, we've had to stop our artistic programme. And because we work with young and emerging artists, they're not getting the opportunities to showcase their talents either, which, of course, will have a knock-on effect in the months and years to come. Um, as you mentioned, some of our work with young people or communities has had to stop, and that affects the local community of Camden and indeed wider London. So not being able to reach those thousands of, of young people in, in an artistic and cultural sense, I think is, is, is obviously devastating for the Roundhouse, but it's also really devastating for those young people who depend on us. And this is their outlet. All the bookings as with everybody that we've lost in the coming weeks and months, that money is funneled straight back into our young people. Um, and we're really fortunate that we have an incredible board of trustees with experience and skills and resource in all different backgrounds. So we're really getting a lot of support and leaning on them and taking guidance from them at the moment. Um, and if we look at the art sector as well, the whole art sector is very uncertain. You look at theatres, um, smaller community groups, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty with that, as well as live gigs, live events, festivals, et cetera. All of the artists who come through the Roundhouse and have come through the Roundhouse for years and years are um, from different genres. And even our live gigs, there's different genre of music, different kind of gigs, whether it be spoken word, et cetera. Uh, we have our main space, but we also have a lot of other spaces within the Roundhouse. And of course, they're closed. And um, you know, at this point, well over 90% of our funding comes from our own commercial income, the food and beverage, et cetera. So it's a significant loss, but that loss isn't just based around the money. It's, it's who we can serve with that money. And, and our young people, they're, they're the ones who, like so many people, are, are suffering because of our closure. Sam, it sounds like you're the beating heart of your community, which is a fantastic position to be in, but it's really quite sad. Yeah, do you know, it's interesting that you say that. The, um, one of our taglines is that young people is, is at the heart of everything that we do, and that's true. And it's our staff that really keep that heartbeat going. So, of course, at the moment, we're not open. Our staff aren't on site. Our young people, did. I had to drive into um, Camden one day last week to pick up some vital um, paperwork. And Camden is just, you know, the whole of Camden is closed. The community is affected. We, the Roundhouse sits very much in the middle of that community. And, you know, everybody's seen this, I understand. But when you drive there and shops and cafes and restaurants are boarded up and the lights are off in the Roundhouse, it, you know, it, it has a, a huge effect on everybody. It really, the whole community is suffering. Sam, thank you. We're going to come back to you later on. And please, everyone, if you have a, a question to ask Sam or anyone that you've seen so far, 
uh, please type your question into the text chat box and we'll make sure they get addressed. I'm going to go now to the more greenfield sites that we have in terms of the panel members, uh, Pascal and Morton. Pascal, perhaps I can come to you first. How are you coping with the Paleo Festival in Switzerland? What's happening now? What are you doing with your staff? And how can you work from home uh, when it comes to organizing a, a festival? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, over, over the past month, we have uh, experienced a very special period uh, that has profoundly changed our professional and personal environments. And these changes have been so deep in such a short time that it's very difficult to assimilate all the issues of this new situation uh, in real time. Just as a remain, uh, reminder, um, Switzerland was the first country to impose a ban on event and crowd gathering by more than a thousand people in the end of February. Uh, and the reaction of the organizers was obviously very negative, some judging this measure to be exaggerated or other complaining about the economic uh, consequences of this decision or, or, or sector. Um, but actually, two weeks uh, later, uh, the Swiss government announced school closure measure and the recommendation to all workers to do a office as much as possible. And at this point, we I think we all understood that the public health objective becomes more important than anything else. So psychologically, uh, as festival organizers, we told to ourselves that we have to, to sit back and wait for it to pass. Uh, our festival is uh, at the end of July and everything should be back to normal then. It has been a, a bit of heroic phase to, to set up the continuity of the activity, you know, motivate our teams to stay focused on the objective, uh, be ready when it starts up again, and so on. But the situation uh, is dragging on. It's not a conventional crisis, uh, you know, with a tragic event occurring and a phase of chaos followed by a uh, construction, uh, reconstruction phase. It's a situation that lasts and uh, a multiplication of uncertainties, uh, both about the spread of the epidemic, the dangerousness of the virus, the adequacy of effectiveness of the health measures uh, taken by the authorities and the time arisen of the crisis as well. So um, in order to assess the risk and make rational decisions, you need clear perspectives to know what kind of game we are playing, to imagine what the situation will be in three months. Uh, whereas in this situation, we don't know what the situation will be in three days. So uh, we, we become aware of something that we don't normally see, actually. Uh, the organization of a festival is a whole chain of independent, interdependent actors and actions and each element is fundamental uh, for the whole to hold together. Uh, if one of the link uh, in the chain fails, the consequences is, is global. Uh, we won't be able to organize a festival and that's it. Uh, whatever the link which, which can be one artist can selling his tour, suppliers with logistical problems to deliver the material or, or service providers. Uh, like blue light services or medical services on the front line of the epidemic at the moment. Uh, what resources will be available at the end of July? That's another question. Um, let's say that in, in the beginning of the crisis two weeks ago, we estimated the risk uh, of not organizing the festival at one in 10. And today the, the scenario to postpone or uh, fifth, uh, 45th uh, edition to 2021 is no longer a theoretical hypo hypothesis and uh, the subject of a, a very in-depth uh, in uh, analysis at the moment. Pascal, thank you. Um, there's a question about casual staff. How are you treating casual staff and what are they doing at the moment? Actually, we, we are all um, working from home. Um, when uh, when the government uh, announces uh, strict measures, um, it's uh, until April uh, 40th uh, at the moment. So um, the staff is working from home. Uh, we try to um, 
keep the link with uh, our employees. Uh, at Paleo, we have uh, 60, 65 employees who work uh, year, long, year round for the festival. Uh, so um, it's, it's a completely change of the habits uh, of working. We have also uh, more than 5,000 people uh, working as volunteer all year long. And uh, we would like to to have them uh, still involved in the preparation of the festival because we are still focusing on the, the, the this year festival, uh, of course. Uh, so, actually, it, it's it's a big challenge to uh, manage the soft part of the problem, meaning the social and collective aspect, uh, to keep our employees and staff motivated. Uh, this forces us to, to be inventive and creative. And for sure, we will have to change our model after this crisis. Uh, we know uh, now that we are able to run the preparation of the festival in distance with, um, with new tools. Uh, we, we do meetings uh, with uh, 20 or 50 people together uh, with uh, Skype or, or Zoom. So it's, it's quite new, but in the same time, maybe very um, interesting. Pascal, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Morton, I'm going to come on to you because you were talk uh, Pascal was talking about volunteers there, 5,000, I think we have a few thousand more. But tell us more, Morton, how you're managing to cope uh, in terms of Ross Kilder. Well, I think our situation is very similar to, uh, to Pascal's because as here we are a large festival. And yes, we are, a, we are joined by 30,000 volunteers to assist us with creating this festival. And I think my thoughts really goes out to a lot of these people. Um, a lot of them are working really, really hard during the year. This is two things for them. One of them is the, the uh, challenges in, in creating a festival like that, which I, am, I have the huge respect for the volunteers that, that I'm working with, because they are really motivated. They are still working hard with the belief that they are going to run a festival. And when you keep on reading in the press, that uh, it's not going to run, <laughs> then that's a challenge to stay motivated. The other reason for people to be uh, be a part of this, well, that's one of the reasons. One of the other reasons are absolutely that it's a social thing. They have their normal job and they do this as a social thing. And not being able to go out and meet with your friends is a challenge. Like everybody else, of course, has that challenge. And lastly, we're a charity organization. So that's also a reason why people are doing it. But I think the, the, the social part is really a big part of it. We are, we are really, really supported by a huge medical team. We have the, the largest, uh, we have 200 doctors and nurses on our side. And they're of course uh, supporting us in how can we manage, how can we run the festival with these issues. Um, but basically it comes down to, at the moment, the law says, uh, like Pascal mentioned, that we are not allowed to gather more in Denmark. It's, you're not allowed to gather more than 10 people at the same time. So we need the law to change again on, until we're allowed to, to run. And that's difficult to keep people motivated and, uh, and up and running. But it, it's, I'm impressed with the energy in our staff. Brilliant. Morton, thank you. I've got a question uh, from Douglas in terms of if it was a case of Ross Kilder being rescheduled for the autumn, uh, do you think you'll be able to get the staff for the autumn as a limited number of security and event crew available, most of whom work for multiple companies? Won't this lead to a shortage of staff? I think in general what we're seeing now is that everybody is moving their events into the autumn or, or the winter. It's all arenas, all venues, everybody is doing that. So I totally agree that's going to be an issue. Um, it's going to be interesting, interesting what's going to happen. And yes, it's an issue for us as well. With 30,000 volunteers, they all put their week vacation in. They know year by year they want to come back. So that's an issue, of course. It's not that simple for us just to move the festival two months. Uh, that's not so simple. And one last question. I've got another one, and we'll come back to you, Morton. But this is from Isla, uh, who's a student um, in events. Um, is there any advice that you would give to students? Maybe you are joining this session. Uh, generally, events students, people heading into the events industry around this time. What would, if you were starting out at this difficult time, what would your advice be to them? Uh, that it's very difficult. <laughs> it is very difficult. That, that, that is the question. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. I think uh, it's. It's kind of almost impossible for them to get in anywhere at the moment. 
right now. I think at the other side of it, we will see an industry that will restart very fast. Um, but at the moment, I think it's kind of impossible to be a student in this. I know a lot of my colleagues around in other venues as well are really not allowed to work from home. Um, so they have been sent home and are not allowed to work for a couple of months. And of course, all students will not be a part of uh, any organization at the moment. They're also being sent home um, from any arena or something like that. So it's kind of impossible at the moment. So <laughs> hang in there, keep uh, motivated. And uh, spend some time on reading all of the materials that are online, like all the good guides and stuff like that. So you are even better prepared when everything starts up. And as uh, Douglas said, I think that there will be a lack of staff when we get on the other side. So instead of just sitting in there watching Netflix or whatever you're doing, start reading and prepare for the other side. Morton, thank you. I'm going to hand over to Chris now. Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Morton. That's been brilliant um, because both you and Pascal have been very, very honest. And I think that's what we need at this time. Um, and sometimes there are no answers, but at other times you can just go day by day, which I think is important to do. Um, just want to go back to Danielle uh, a second. Um, although at the moment we're in lockdown, at some stage we're going to be outside <coughs> of this. What are you doing in anticipation of this and how will life be different for your venue after the virus? Yeah, it's... It the teams have coped very well in general. Um, it's been strange because we're so used to working at 100 miles an hour. There's no time for reflection. You do the job and you're constantly planning for the future. So all of a sudden this stop, I guess, has allowed us time to reflect, um, which we don't often have time to do. Um, the team can do some sort of internal reflection about what they want to do for the future and how they plan for that and what sort of training um, that they would like to do as well. Um, and sorry, what was the second part, the, what we were looking for for the future, Chris, did you say? So how, how will it change after the, the virus is over? Will things be different? Will they be the same? Or can you not predict that? I think there's a lot of questions we can't answer at the moment, but what I am confident, two things I'm confident is that our industry is exceptionally resilient there is a huge amount of passion um, that is out there for our industry. And that's from the workforce, but also from our fans, our bands, our brands, all of those guys. I think they're all going to be super keen to get back to that as quickly as possible. But I do believe there will be a change in behavior. And I think that's something that we're all going to have to learn to adapt to very quickly. And we're going to have to be flexible and agile on our plans because I think the general public are going to have, you know, concerns about coming back to mass gatherings and have anxiety now from how they should socially distance. And I think there will be a, a, a bit of a slow burn in some areas. So, you know, the elderly crowd, for instance, that might impact them so much, much more than it would do a younger crowd who just feels, you know, that they they can do whatever they like and, uh, and they are safe to do so. So I think we're going to have to really adapt the way in which we think and our venue is going to have to be flexible to put plans in place quickly to make sure that our customer feels safe, secure and is happy to visit us. Um, but also for our workforce as well, you know, our teams are our past, they're our present and they're absolutely our future. Um, so we need to make sure that we're constantly giving them as much information as we can. And I think what we've learned from this process is communication is key. And while the communication has been quite hard um, because we haven't known all the answers and, and we're the people that are meant to know these answers, and we're certainly, it's certainly not comfortable ground for us to not be able to have a plan, uh, get that plan out there and, and, and put it into action quite quickly. We're all quite, um, resilient and we're able to adapt to that I think so um, and what I've seen is the kind of you know what Morton was saying about the energy I think everybody is one team at the moment and I think that's been amazing to watch so I think like I say main focus is change on behavior how do we kind of adapt to that make sure our customers and our staff feel comfortable um, and make sure that we're communicating via all different levels to to get back to what we what we are good at doing and, and what we all love to do. Yeah, I think with some of the things that we've seen as well, I mean, I'm in contact with quite a lot of people from venues 
and a lot of them have been furloughed, but they're working free of charge for the national health. So they're doing a lot of volunteer work and helping because that's what people in venues do. It's their kind of life. They want to do that kind of thing to help the community, which I think is really commendable. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a lot of that. A lot of our teams are keen to help, you know, where we're based in, in, uh, in Greenwich, we've got the Nightingale Hospital that is soon to open tomorrow, in fact. Um, and a lot of our teams are wanting to volunteer and help wherever they can. And, and so much so, you know, what can we give to our NHS? What can we now donate that we don't need? You know, our food, our drinks, our sanitizers, our, our kitchen blue rolls, whatever it is that we can give them at the moment, we, we want to be able to help. And I think we are a group of people that needs to be active. So for us to be at home, not being able to help is, is probably the hardest thing for our guys, I think. Yeah. Danielle, thank you very much. Uh, if I can come to Liam now, and Liam, you've got a fan in the audience here. I think it's uh, Ellie Coon, who said, Liam, legend, uh, way to go. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, you're famous there. Liam, tell us more about uh, moving things. You talked about the need to create space. It's not easy to carry stuff over into the next year and you've, you've got a full constant calendar anyway, and football has priority. How do you manage all of those things? Um, it, the tricky bit that I don't think people realise is that um, Wembley Stadium doesn't really own the lander outside. Um, we own the outer concourse, and then as soon as you go beyond that, it's owned by different landlords, uh, the biggest one, Quintain. Um, we needed all that space um, for the actual Euros because the broadcast for it is huge. So we were occupying uh, a brand new car park that had been built, uh, had a lot of open land on there, um, and all that was set. And we were also using Wembley Arena. Uh, Wembley Arena was going to be our main hub for all our volunteers, and they're all parts over there. So we had to go and approach those guys again. So again, the tournament team had a lot of work to do and do it very quickly. Um, so they could go back to UEFA and say, it's actually feasible for us to move it into 2021. Um, fortunately, John Jory and his team over at Wembley Arena have been brilliant um, and we've managed to secure that, you know, so we've got that for 21 and um, to make that work. So it was that case of that, um, how we do that. Also availability of staff. So whilst the LOS is a huge number of staff that are on there, they tend to be people who are on the circuit. So they're moving from um, things like Commonwealth Games, the Olympics and all this. And, and again, all those things have been postponed and been delayed on that side on the Olympics and other smaller tournaments and things like that. So you're constantly looking to see, do you have the availability of those people who have managed to secure because some of the best of their business. So you're really trying to look at all that side of it. So the practical side of it was really, really difficult. And but it, everybody wanted an answer yesterday. Um, so you're quickly trying to establish okay, if we sit down practically, can we do this? And, and it quickly came back, yes, because again, you're dealing with planets, you're dealing with people who can, who are used to getting um, curveballs thrown at them all the time, and we threw the biggest curveball ever for that side. Um, we also had to look at our um, staff who are available, who work with us all the time, our event day staff. So when they come in, we have zero hours contract staff who come in, um, who may have another job somewhere else, but work for us. Um, and we need to make sure that they're, they're still okay. Um, and it's difficult because the, the Football Association is a not-for-profit organisation. So we're not like the Premier League with big shareholders, with big people, what you can do. So we have to be very careful what we're doing with the money and to make sure that we're looking after initially the internal core. Um, so they're able to deliver that again next year. Um, but also all of those transient staff who you deal with. So you're constantly talking to the companies who are out there. Um, we have for an event, on average, 1,500 stewards. Um, and out of 1,500 stewards, it's something like 20 stewarding companies. So what are those guys doing? Because, you know, they're facing uh, all kinds of hell at the moment because of the availability of work for those guys. So we're talking to those guys because when somebody does come back to us and says, okay, we can switch on mass gatherings again, you need to make sure that you can switch it on because you know, suppliers that you've had, that you've worked with for many years, are they still there? Are they still available to you? Um, or have they gone under because of what's happened? So it's a very difficult thing. So I was picking up on some of the questions on the side of with these events, if we switch back in autumn and that side, and it is a very tricky one. So you are, your communication with those people has to continue. You have to talk to them to see how they are. Um, because 
um, furloughing staff. You know, we haven't yet, but I'm sure we're about to, and we're discussing it. Now, if we're going to furlough staff, I need to make sure that I keep certain key members that are able to keep the cogs greased, because the last thing I need is everybody is involved, and then it comes back to switching it back on, and you, you simply can't, because, you know, everything has stopped in that way. So it's very, very important when we're <laughs> talking to our bosses that they understand switching all of this back on is going to be difficult. Now, whether the stadium's asked to play a game behind closed doors, um, or it actually goes back to a full mass gathering, how do you switch that back on and how those key people are there? So that applied to the Euros again for next year, because the one thing we don't know is when this is going to be switched back on. You know, everybody has best guesses, everybody looks at the curves, nobody knows. And that's the key to all of this. And I think Danielle's right, as a planner, that is a horrible place to be in. You know, we like where the line is, where the finish line is, that we, we work our trajectory to do that so that we can sprinting over that line at the end. We don't know where that line is. How do we actually get to that point and how do we keep the momentum going? And that's the really difficult bit out of all of this. William, thank you. On that point, Andreas has a question about when we do get back together again. I'm assuming you're thinking there's a whole bunch of new guidelines in terms of social distancing, uh, safety distance for front stage workers and so on. It's, it's brand new when we start again. I think it's difficult as well because somebody asked me, well, somebody said to me, oh, it's all got to change. I said, but what changes? There are certain things you can bring in when it comes to hygiene, when it comes to that side. Um, we have a, um, a, uh, an app that we work alongside, it's called CrowdSafe, and we brought it in to look at how we can book in all of our staff, how we do all of our reporting, for instance. That's now had to adapt. So we're talking to those guys to see, okay, while somebody does check their bathrooms and checks all that side, I think now you're going to have to be really critical on how exactly you're checking that you have soap and water, that you have anti gel, that it's there, that if it's being used up during the day, who's flagging that? How quick is that coming back? Because people are going to... New security measures came in after all the, the atrocities that we saw in our industry. This is going to be very similar. Customers are going to look to you to see that you are providing these measures. Um, when it comes to social distancing, I don't know how that would work um, because I think for a, a stadium, an arena, a venue of any sort, you are viable because you're based on your capacity. Um, and if somebody suddenly turns around and says, okay, you can only sell every third seat because of social distancing, you're dropping down the actual capacity of your venue and then commercially it's gonna really hurt. Um, and it's just not viable. You know, you built these stadiums, these arenas to operate at that capacity to bring in that income because of what it costs to run it. Um, and if you suddenly drop that, that's going to be a huge hit on the industry. So you're kind of hoping we get to a point when there is a vaccine and everything comes out and that we kind of get to that point of what seasonal flu is whilst it's still risky. But people actually come back. I think Daniel's right. The invincibles of the world, of the youth who think they're invincible, still come. But are you concerned the minute you switch this back on, you try to sell tickets and you only sell 25% of your tickets because people are choosing not to go there. To get to Wembley Stadium, it's a public transport venue. 80% of our public come via public transport. Our car parks are minimal. So who's going to travel on public transport? Are they confident in that? So there are so many unknowns and you're right. For the planning, they're the bits you're trying to decide what you put in, what those new measures will be. And I'm sure that for us over in the UK, we have um, the SGSA, Sports Ground Safety Authority, the stadiums and that sign, that's the green guide. And I'm sure that there's going to be new paragraphs added that people are going to be looking for, for what the guide is on that. And maybe the government will bring legislation in. We just don't know at this point. Thank you, Liam. That's been really, really helpful. I mean, you're so candid with what you're saying, and I think it's really important for everybody to hear this because this is what's happening now. <clears throat> and it's happening everywhere. I think it's really important. Coming back to you, Sam, um, you've got a lovely venue. I mean, it's a beautiful, iconic place. Um, starting up again after the virus, will there be a period of darkness? Because you have theatre programmes as well as everything else. Um, are you already planning hard or provisionally booking acts uh, and classes going forward? Because it's not just music that you put on the venue. It's a real wide range of things that you do. Yeah, it is, Chris. And, and if I'm honest, it's a mixture of both. Danielle and, and Liam have both hit on it. We don't really know. But what we are doing is we're, we're planning the best we can for that. So, you know, we've talked about business continuity. I think what we're all looking at now is that business recovery. 
So for us, we've restart, restarted um, scheduling gigs and private events. We're looking at our artistic program. Our key point will need to be that we can reopen the building safely for our young people, visitors, and our staff. And of course, it depends on how long we've been closed as to how much work we will need to be able to do to get to that point. One of the things that me and my team have started working on is a reopening strategy. And one of the things that we'll consider there is whether we need a phased opening and how on earth do we manage that with, again, our staff, artists and young people? And how do we communicate that? Um, we're assessing and planning what programmes we can deliver, as, as you talked about, so that our young people can come back to those programmes and can they be involved in any artistic programmes as well? And I think a key point is, again, which, is, which has been mentioned a little bit is, that if the government do lift restrictions, will they still have bans on public gatherings and will it be over a certain amount? So for us, it might be that our studios can open for our young people, but the main space might not be able to open. And the chicken and egg there for us is, of course, it's our main space activity, which funds those studios and the programmes for the young people. So we might find ourselves in a situation where we can work with young people, but actually we've got to find the funding to do that. And in terms of, of darkness, we're obviously dark at the moment. Um, and I noticed a question came through about this as well is, we've got statutory inspections coming up in the coming week. So we're really looking into how we can do that, or if we can't do them, when can we do them? Bearing in mind that everybody will, will have their Lola inspections, et cetera, due in, in the coming months or in the next 12 months. Um, and do we risk assess that? And we're looking at that as part of our reopening strategy as well. Um, Hannah, who's our Head of Events and Commercial Strategy, is doing a massive piece of work of how we reposition our approach in commercial terms so that we can fund all our work. And, you know, I think as with all of us, we're keeping in touch with our key promoters, our key contractors, our key staff, key members of the community, just so that when we are in a position that we can open, that we are ready to go. But ultimately, it is driven by funds and resources which is where our reopening strategy comes in. And then uh, as Liam has talked about as well, just what is the government, not even just guidance, but what are the, what are the government's um, hardcore kind of, you must adhere to these, this information gonna be. And, and that's something that we don't know. We can only predict what it might possibly be. Sam, thank you. Your passion really comes across, so it's uh, uh, inspirational to hear you talk. Morton, can I come to you, please? Because you said you wanted to comment on the gathering side of it. I also wonder whether you can talk about the links in the chain in terms of funding uh, that Pascal was talking about. Morton, over to you. Yeah, I, I would just like to start saying, why are people actually going to concerts and events? I think that that's an issue because our mindset with the festival isn't really that we are providing concerts. It's that we are providing an, an atmosphere of people being, uh, shaking out of their normal environment, that they are, uh, we are presenting concerts. When they have something together, they are more willing to be standing closer. They like to be standing closer. And that brings them into being open-minded. So when they walk around and they are then looking at us, or uh, something else, then they are more open-minded and they, they start talking together. Because as long as you invite people within your, your own personal space, you are getting open for them. And that's the reason why we are presenting concerts. So how do you do that with the aspect of asking people not to be standing close? So I think, for, I think there's an issue here in, in either we are allowed to be together or we are not. And that's what, what is going to be very interesting when in Denmark, when the government are opening up, how are they opening up? Um, what, how is it going to happen, right? So I think that's going to be interesting. And on the provider side, as you were asking, I think this is also, of course, a big issue. We are, of course, calling all of our providers and saying, are we still having an agreement? Uh, what's going to happen if we cancel? What's going to happen if we postpone? Um, when do we need to know? Uh, there was one of uh, the people who uh, were here who asked, why didn't you just move the festival instead of waiting for a new date? Well, we have 180 bands, uh, artists uh, and vendors and uh, 130,000 people. It's not something you just move. And, and it, in our mind, it would be irresponsible 
to start a canceling or moving something that might break down because moving as long as we are still able to run the festival and as long as the government are not telling us if we are allowed to imagine that we postponed it and it all fell apart everybody didn't want to come or we canceled it and then in one week the government said okay by July 1st, you are allowed, or by June 15, you are allowed to be uh, mass gathered again with 135,000 people. Yeah. I think there is a lot of people who would be crying if that happened. <laughs> we, have to, we have to trust in the government that they will tell us how we manage afterwards. That's really interesting, Morton, because it's such a huge festival. And I think some people don't realize how big it actually is and all the things that go into this. So having to put all of those permutations together is really, really difficult. For you, Pascal, it's even more difficult before, because your festival has not put tickets on sale yet. So what difficulties do you face and what does the future hold for the festival? Yeah, actually to, to answer your question, I just need to make some explanation on the Paleo Festival business and communication model because we are uh, used since many years to announce the whole program in one go, trying to create the biggest focus around and uh, uh, launching the following times the ticket sales, meaning one one week later. Um, and we should have announced a lineup on March 24th and put the ticket on sales uh, the week on April, this week actually, April 1st, two days ago. And uh, obviously it was no more possible after the government announcement. Uh, you know, you, you don't announce your, the wedding date, date on the day of a, of a funeral. So we decided then to postpone the announcement of the lineup to May uh, 5th, put on sale on 13th. Uh, and the idea then was to extend the deadline, but to keep the same strategy, uh, to keep the sales uh, momentum. And I would say this is the plan B, and we are now on the plan B, but uh, this decision was made uh, three weeks ago, and during that time we have been continually monitoring the situation in order to, to adapt our strategy to the recent news. And talking today, I would say that we are considering uh, a plan C. Uh, if we are not able to keep our calendar and uh, are forced to change strategy, and we are in touch with um, uh, between festivals uh, to share information, trying to have a, a common strategy instead of uh, fighting against each other's. Um, some festivals bring the idea to postponing the edition to the next year with the same artist, which implies a common approach between organizers, which is not that easy. And in this perspective, uh, it would be rather an advantage not to have announced a lineup since we would uh, be more free uh, if we had to change an artist, for example, in the lineup for 2021, it would not put, put us in a situation of having to justify ourselves uh, since we haven't promised anything yet. Uh, and this is obviously not the same situation for festivals like Roskilde, for instance, who have announced their, their entire lineup and sold all the tickets. So that's why it's very difficult to, to find a common uh, message between the festival organizers, but that's the challenge uh, of, of these days. Pascal, thank you. Danielle, just pick up on some of those points if you can. And also, I come back and add a question. We're joined online today by some small venues, and some could say, and I've not seen it as a question, but it's conceivable, that you're a big venue, so therefore it's easy for you. What would you say to that? I don't think it's easy for anybody. I think um, I think the size of the venue is kind of irrelevant because you all have exactly the same processes in place. You just have slightly bigger teams you're maybe dealing with or slightly bigger contractors. Um, so it's incredibly challenging for everybody as an industry. And like Liam said earlier, you know, switching off this machine and switching it back on is incredibly challenging for everyone. Um, and we're all going to be in the same boat where the end of the year is going to be that much more busy than it, it would have been. And also, you know, next year now is going to be incredibly busy as well, while we all shift all of our calendar back. Um, and then, you know, the other issue we, we've got to think about is, will there be another wave of this that comes in the winter um, or, you know, early next year? So 
I think it's challenging for everybody. Um, I don't. I think none of us are alone, and none of us have, have got it easy at the moment. Um, I think all businesses in general are really struggling to deal with the unknown and, and how they cope and move forward and, and, and make sure that their business is still functioning at the end of this. There's some positive news, Danielle. Just so you can comment on this point by Paul Paul MacArthur, who's saying that. Uh, as, a, as a security and crowd safety supplier in my place of 500 PAYE employees, I feel the security and stewarding industry will adapt very quickly to life back on the event calendar. What do you think of that? I think he's absolutely right. I think, you know, our guys are just chomping at the bit to get back into it. So um, I do think everybody will adapt quickly. And I think our staff are resilient and have done this for such a long period of time that it's second nature to them and, and they can come back in and just be ecstatic to be there so i think that, that there's good news for that um, and i think you know ultimately the government um sort of working schemes that have come into place now to support those i is fantastic and you know i think we're all exceptionally pleased that that has come in to support our guys and we know that they can now not worry so much you know being without a job they, they know there is a job at the end of this and there is a light at the end of the tunnel which is is fantastic because before that point we were all exceptionally worried about how that was going to impact those, those guys, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting, Danielle, because uh, that impact is, is very important, and especially for people who are on zero hours contracts moving forward as well, because there will be a lot of work when we come out of this eventually, um, and that's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, Liam? You have a lot of infrastructure built around the stadium and other elements. If you think about the Euros, you also had live sites, you also had all sorts of things. There's 12 stadiums across Europe all trying to get this going. How has it affected them as well as you and what's your relationship with them through the Euros? It, it was difficult because you had a, lo uh, a lot of local government involvement. Um, so for us, uh, the GLA with those live sites, um, Greenwich and Pottersfield and places like that, and at the moment, their obvious focus is this virus and how it's affecting them, and their communities. So you've, you've got to tread carefully with it. You know, it's it's one of those things that you don't even see this crass that you're trying to um, be a little bit blinkered looking at your event and and reorganising that for next year because people are going through turmoil, you know, and local governments are going through turmoil. Um, whilst the main government in the UK are investing really well to help people on that side which is refreshing to see um you've just got to be careful what you're asking and, and when to ask um but you do have your job to do which is to ensure that these things are secured for next year so it's a it's a very difficult tightrope to walk um, when you're talking to these guys um and just picking your moment and understanding that people you might normally talk to are doing something different or are wearing several hats right now you know for that side of it so and then it's the whole thing of furloughing with other companies. You know, who have you lost out of your normal contacts that um, you can't really talk to um, because they're told to sit on their hand as part of this deal. Um, and that's across the board, you know, for everyone we're dealing with for all of these sites. So if you think of a, a huge tournament like the Euros, it involves so many different companies from everything you need from your suppliers um, up to the government side of things. But it's really important to get those people quickly on the, the the boxes that have been ticked just to show that, okay, I feel that we're there and we're okay on that side of it. Um, same again with the emergency services, you know, working closely with those guys, how can you really go to them right now and say, I've got an event in, in 12 months time, can you tell me what you can do for that? Um, and you don't, you, you just, you, you have to understand, you have to have empathy right now just to understand what's needed. I think the public will be crying out for some sort of social entertainment by the time they come out of this. Um, as you can see with everything that's on the TVs and everything that's on there. And it's an amazing community right now and an understanding. So you just need to be careful with your events that you approach that correctly, that you're there to, to service rather than commercial reasons. And that's the bit that I think will change. And I think people will understand that and won't be as crass and pushing it down their throats. People need, the reason why our entertainment industry thrives so much is because we need escapism. You know, we, we all work very hard at what we do um, and you need escapism and our entertainment industry provides that. But you need to ensure that balance is correct when we do switch it all back on and that people understand that's what's doing. I think there'll be a lot of requests that are coming in 
from the charity side with the NHS to recognise everything they're doing. But the NHS over in the UK are amazing, but it's key workers. You know, it's as Paul MacArthur said there, those those security guys who have now switched over that are assisting working alongside hospitals, you know, and putting themselves on the front line. Yes, there's an economy, but they, those guys still need income because there's one thing worrying about shortages of food, there's another thing for the food. So they're going to work wherever they can. Um, but they're key workers, these guys, you know, they're out there, they're doing whatever they can and putting themselves at risk, you know, for what they're doing. So when you understand all of that and you understand your place in the middle of that, that's when you will make this successful. Um, so I think there'll be discussions that everybody who's on this is probably operational and probably has that sort of thought process in their head. It's when we have our discussions with our commercial bosses above us. And that's the bit that I think our voices will be louder at the table than they once were. Um, so we understand we need to deliver this for the right reasons and the public need to understand it. If you get that right, then as the old um, things goes, build it and they will come, they will. If you get it right, they'll come back to you. So it's good. Liam, thank you. That's a Co Kevin Costner film, which is actually That's quite a good film. Thank you for that. Um, Sam, can I quickly come to you on a point uh, that Liam made there? I'm sorry, by the way, we have run over the time. So hopefully if you're gonna stick around, uh, if you keep the questions coming, we'll go on at least until quarter past the hour. Sam, if I can come back to uh, Liam's point there about escapism, how are you balancing, Sam, the escapism that Liam talks about and the need to get out and, and see and do things with the mental health of the people that you're responsible for? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, you know, young people are at the heart of everything we do, and it's our staff that keeps that heartbeat going. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I think just being honest, I think everybody's hurting. We're hurting that we're closed, as everybody is. and. So it's really key for us that we are providing support from each other for each other. And that could be everybody from the front of house staff, the back of house staff, our leadership team. We are all really leaning on each other. And I think that's one thing that we found is it's so important to ask people how they're doing constantly, um, provide support when needed, use outside sources. We've got our employee assistance program, which we know people are, are using. Um, in the run up to closing, when we knew it was going to happen, we purchased um, laptops and over 50 members of staff who didn't have the ability to work from home or even perhaps the communication methods now have a laptop. And that means that they can use technology to keep in touch with other people, whether it be video calls, conference calls. We use Slack, we've got Slack channels, we've got work channels, absolutely, but we've also got a general channel. Um, one of the um, one of our team set up a um, send pictures of your pets working from home with you and, and everybody's posted pictures of their cats and dogs and, and that actually has been a really uplifting thing for everybody to keep in touch with things that, that way. Our chief exec writes daily as like a little newsletter to the entire organisation and those people who don't have access to company emails, their head of departments are screenshotting it and WhatsApping it to them. So they are in touch with the chief exec daily. Um, he's also done one video and we're constantly reviewing other mechanisms we can use. Um, we're hoping that it keeps people's brains active, involved. We hope that people feel still connected even though they can't be there in person. And we've, got, we've got people doing um, online training courses. I'm sure everybody knows so many companies um, offer free training courses, we've got people doing the prevent training who, who wouldn't normally do that. And I, and I actually finding it really enjoyable and giving them confidence. If there's a few of them doing those online training programs, they're discussing it with each other. So we found that that's really, really helpful. We're obviously looking at government initiatives so we can financially support our staff. We've compiled lists of guidance documents where they can just click or telephone calls they can make. and um, some of our teams have really um, approached this head on themselves, which is great because that means it's not just coming from their head of department or, or a director. Uh, so, for example, our technical and production team are working with a scheme called People Powered, um, which I think many of you are aware of. They're working with the NHS, looking at things like um, scoping out car parks that could be used for testing, um, uh, things like um, um, testing locations, logistics, et cetera. And that's our technical and production team who are leading that themselves. And I think this has empowered other people within our organization to look at what they can do. Um, 
we did a desktop exercise a few months ago relating to pandemic flu. And this was something that we perhaps hadn't considered. And the fact that our staff are really communicating with each other and taking things forward and empowering each other, showing empathy for each other is a really, really wonderful thing and something that we believe is really helping everybody. So it very much is a team effort. It's fantastic to see this, Sam, because you did such a lot for the people there. And, and a lot of the artistic people are really creative. And some of the ideas that are coming out of there are really, really good. Thank you for that. Uh, Martin, looking to the future, how bright is it for Ross Kielder? Um, and what are the, some of the things you've been putting in place to future proof your business? You know, how do you keep the motivation going, people engaged? Um, you know, this RF experience is a huge thing. How does that keep going in uncertain times? Uh, I think the future is bright. The, the very near future might be confusing, but the future as a future is bright. Um, we are doing a lot of interesting things. I think, um, again, the, the overall aspect of being a charity organization, nonprofit, is by far outranking being a festival. So we will always come up with new ideas, and I'm not saying that there's not going to be a festival, but what happened is that there's so many other things going around the festival. Um, it's, it's similar to, to Sam, what she's saying. We, we have so much impact in what's going around everywhere. Today, for example, we launched this campaign called uh, Time to Create, where we basically go in and ask uh, people who are uh, creative, uh, we will pay them a day salary to actually create something that we can put on our medias um, just to, to help them out. And, uh, and we are still in the process of donating all of the money from last year. And we will keep on doing that, even though it's of course challenging this year. So I think the future is bright. I think um, there's so much community around uh, the organization and the charity organization that makes it very strong more than just being this well. And then, of course, we also have the, the aspect of having the company, which, of course, at the moment is also a challenge when everybody else is, is canceling their shows. But as we were talking about earlier, we will see more shows. Uh, we will have a very busy year, most likely next, next year. The fall might be very uh, busy. So that will help us out that we are not only a festival, but we are actually in operation all of the year trying to get knowledge to bring into the festival, take the knowledge from the festival and bring out to the society. Morton, thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Pascal, if I can come to you, because you know an awful lot about the European industry in general. What are your final thoughts, Pascal, around the festival scene in, in Europe, given what you've heard today? We may have lost Pascal. Pascal, you could be on mute. I'll give you a second or two to come back. Yeah. There you are. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yes, it, it, it's a very difficult question because, um, as I said previously, uh, it's now very difficult to anticipate the future. So everything is possible, the worst and the best. Um, but in the same time, probably, if I, if I take the example of, of my festival, uh, independent festival uh, have one problem in this situation. They only have one opportunity in the year to collect revenue. So if you miss a year for any reason or uh, under any, any circumstances, the whole project, project is at risk. Uh, so uh, maybe it's, it's a business model that we have to, to think about and um, to uh, think what, what would what would we learn if we had to live a white year without a festival, uh, and not as, not only in the financial or financial point of view, because I'm quite sure uh, we we can ensure the continuity of the festival, such as the event industry will re rebuild and uh, be resilient, but in in a social point of view, meaning how to maintain the motivation and the involvement of our staff. Uh, for us, it's volunteer team, lead, team leaders, uh, but we would love to, to think about putting in place tools to keep the community going, uh, maintain the link between us, just like, uh, of course, e-learning or uh, social events. Uh, um, 
perspective to change the way we look at our organizations of our current functioning. So it can be as much as having creative ruptures uh, that force us to change paradigm, paradigm and to open up to new and stimulating approaches in terms of management. So, so we must know how to remain positive and be prepared to be resilient, I would say. Pascal, thank you. Um, we're going to have to finish fairly soon now. We did promise to have one hour, and we're over that one hour. Um, Chris, do you have any finishing comments on what it is that you've heard in this last hour? Yeah, I think the one thing that's come across massively is the amount of community there is between people and the fact that it's nobody's fault that this was caused, that it's actually something that everybody's got to deal with comes across really strongly because everybody's trying to, to help each other. And I think also with it, there's a number of things that have come out on help on what people are doing so people can hear that and think they're not the only ones alone doing this. And I think that means a lot to people. And it doesn't matter how big or how small your venue is, everybody's in this together and everybody is trying to get back. If you think about it, the music, events, arts and culture are some of the biggest things that we all love in the world. And to have those taken away from us is a massive, massive downer. And this is why it's so important that as soon as possible, when we can get that back on stream, we need to be doing this, but that can't be done for everybody safe. And I think it's it's something that we all are thinking about. And it's something that everybody's trying to change things and make things. It actually makes you wonder when thinking about it, if there are or we will have to do events in different ways. Because we've always done events as we've always done them. So is it time that we change the way that we do things so that we make things work in a different way? Chris, thank you. David, if you can give me presenter rights. So thank you indeed, the audience, for joining us for this uh, session. Uh, some fantastic questions. We haven't answered them all. Apologies for that. And I think that with that in mind, uh, I think Chris and I certainly would like to consider running another one of these. Uh, let me know on the text chat if that's of interest. This has been recorded. Uh, so for those of you that uh, know people that would have liked to have attended, and we did have a limit, unfortunately, which we weren't aware of uh, joining this session. We can make that uh, recording available uh, live online, uh, but it's worthwhile running another one of these events too. So we'll do that. Um, David, if you can give me the control, if you have, I think you have, thank you. Um, we do have another one of these events taking place later on this month. And I'm just gonna share a slide. Uh, deliberately didn't do much in the way of um, points on this one, uh, but we are gonna run another event uh, which is related to crowded spaces. This is on counterterrorism. And I think our friend and colleague, Pete Dalton, who's on this call, uh, will be helping out with that one. So if you're interested, please keep that date free in your diaries. Um, and thank you again for joining us. And we will let you know you by the usual channels uh, if and when we run another one of these Crowded Space uh, events events, as I'm, so to speak. So thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day and please stay safe. Thank you.